Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to just give it a few minutes um, and let everyone join. Um, but thank you for joining us uh, this evening on this lovely sunny um, spring evening. Welcome everyone. We're just going to give it just one minute and just let everyone have a chance to join. But thank you for joining us this evening. I think we will um, kick it off. So my name is Aoife Breslin and I'm the Head of Marketing and Comms for, for Sims IDF. Um, just, a, just a little bit thing uh, just about Sims IDF. So we are one of the largest providers of um, fertility treatment in Ireland. So we have six locations um, all throughout Ireland. So we've, we've three um, main clinics. So we have our clinic in Clonsky, we have our clinic in Swords, and we have a clinic down in Cork. And then what we have what we call satellite clinics, which kind of provide bloods and scans throughout your treatment cycle. So you don't have to keep traveling back to Dublin all the time or, or Cork. So we have those in Limerick, Dundalk and uh, Carlow. And um, we're also part of Virtus Health, which is a, a global provider of um, fertility treatments. So like they have clinics all over Australia, Europe, Singapore and the UK. Um, tonight we're joined um, by Julian Roman, who is our lab manager in Klonski. I know we had advertised it was going to be Monday, but Julian has kindly jumped in this evening um, to uh, provide a, a re really interesting presentation. Um, we will take questions, um, but if you want to pop them, there's a little Q&A box down at the end. If you want to pop all your questions in there, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Okay, Julian, I think I'll, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Perfect. So I'm just going to share my screen now. All right. So is it um, good? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Julian Roman. I'm, as uh, Ifa said, I'm the lab uh, manager, uh, IDF lab manager here in the Plansky Clinic. Um, so. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of SIMS uh, to our uh, state-of-the-art embryology lab uh, this evening, and we will talking about uh, we will talk about the IVF cycles from the lab perspective, and then delving in uh, a little deeper into the one particular special service that we're offer, which is the PGT, which stands for pre-implantation genetic testing of the of the embryos. So firstly, I'll give you a quick overview of the IVF cycle and a little about the embryology. Uh, then we'll go deeper into the genetics and the specifics of the PGT cycle. So in order to test the embryos, uh, to, to, to the genetic testing for the embryos, we need to have the embryos. So uh, an IVF cycle firstly involves a series of hormone injections, blood tests, and monitoring scans over a period of uh, around 10, 14 days. Uh, what is achieved is that uh, instead of one follicle growing and ovulating a single egg, as would happen in the natural monthly menstrual cycle, multiple follicles are stimulated to grow and develop. And this growth is closely monitored by our doctors and our nursing staff, looking at how well the follicles are growing uh, using ultrasound and testing estrogen and other hormone uh, levels in the blood. The aim being to achieve the best possible ovarian response from this hormone score uh, for each patient. Once the decision is made that the follicles uh, are growing uh, in the ovaries and have reached the appropriate size, then a trigger, which is an injection um, uh, given to mimic the surge of hormones seen in the body around the time of ovulation. Uh, this injection basically stimulates the egg growing uh, in the ovaries to mature so we can collect them mature at the time of uh, uh, egg collection, which is a, um, a surgical procedure. The eggs are collected surgically, uh, meaning that the patient will be sedated uh, and the needle is used to puncture each follicle of, on, on the ovary to collect the fluid from the follicles. And the microscopic egg come out from the fluid. You can see it here in the uh, bottom right picture. 
sort of our eggs are covered with follicular cells. These cells are very much involved in the maturation of the egg. Um, and um, um, the follicle, the, the, the liquid, as you see here in the, in the tubes, um, you know, it's, it is the liquid that contains this cumulus enclosed oocytes. The cumulus the eggs are uh, then uh, washed in this nice culture dishes and uh, they're allowed uh, to be cultured for a couple of hours before insemination. Uh, you can have here a microscopic insight of the uh, humming crib, uh, just like uh, you've seen uh, in, you know, newborn babies in the movie. So basically, these are some uh, very nicely controlled uh, temperature um, units where we look. The, uh, the goal is to maintain the physiological temperature um, at all the time for, uh, for the samples. Once all, all the eggs are found, they are placed into a, a clean dish, the one that you see on the top right. Um, and as I said, they are allowed for uh, to incubate a couple of hours uh, before insemination. Uh, around the same time, we process the, the sperm sample. So um, here is a video of a fresh sperm sample. When we get a sample, a sperm sample into the lab, we look for several things. Uh, mostly the concentration, how many sperms they are in the sample, the motility on um, how well those sperm are moving, and the morphology, which is basically separating the uh, bread pits from the Homer Simpsons. So the vast majority of the human sperm look abnormal. So the normal, the, the rate of normal looking sperm is somewhere between four and ten percent, and uh, you can see here that they're there's a high variability on the morphology of the sperm. Depending on the, on, on the quality of the overall sample, the insemination may be done using one of the two different techniques that are uh, um, you know, classic now in the IVF lab. The first technique is the one most people think of when they say IVF, meaning you know, we're simply mixing the eggs uh, with sperm together in the dish. And this will be recommended mostly for good quality samples. But if the sample is quite poor, uh, meaning that we have fewer sperm or uh, lower motility overall, um, we perform what is called ICSI, which stands for intracytoplasmic sperm insemination. So that means that a single sperm will be injected into each of the mature eggs. This is a common occurrence now, uh, and the aim is to maximize the fertilization. So just a quick example here, IVF, as I said, this is a generic picture uh, of you know, the sperm getting um, um, mixed with the eggs. And then in the middle, um, in the middle section, we have um, the ICSI procedure. So first we select the sperm, we look at the morphology, we look at the motility, we try to select only the uh, normal looking sperm. We have to cut their tails to immobilize them. Normally the sperm which gets inside the egg on, on the natural uh, insemination or fertilization is not motile anymore. So we swipe the, we swipe the uh, sperm tail with the, um, uh, with the injection needle. And this is also for releasing the factors which start the process of fertilization in the egg. Uh, then we use suction to get the sperm inside the needle, and in the next video we see how the um, how the uh, uh, how the sperm is inseminated in the mature egg. So in a separate drop, we we we, we place the eggs, and um, as um, as you can see now the eggs are clean; they don't have those cells that uh, surround them at the egg collection, so they are removed just before the injection. All the mature eggs can be injected with a single sperm. We know that the egg is mature because of the presence of that little fragment at the top. This shows up basically that his, the, the egg is gone through the final maturation process and has splitted the DNA, the chromosomes. So half of them remain in the egg and half of them are in that, um, in that small fragment on top. We use some gentle suction to hold up the egg in place, and uh, this uh, holds the egg still uh, while we inject. 
because when you're injecting something smaller than a, a, a full stop, you you want it to stay still. Uh, you have to imagine that the egg is around 200 micrometers and the sperm is around five micrometers in diameter. The eggs are left then overnight after the injection or after in the IVF insemination to fertilize. Uh, normally fertilization occurs somewhere between six and 16 hours, uh, very different for, uh, for uh, each of the eggs. Fertilization rates with DXC are typically a bit higher, around 70% uh, compared to uh, compared to IVF, and this is just because we have the certainty that we actually put one of the sperm inside the inside the egg. But obviously, this technique is a bit more invasive, and uh, we, you know, there, there is a risk of egg degeneration. Usually, this happens with poorer quality eggs. Um, which is why uh, we go, um, you know, we, we do a lot of training basically when before somebody is actually signed off to do this uh, very, uh, very particular procedure. A6 cycles, in addition to be being preferred to poorer quality sperm, can also be done in cases of previous poor or failed fertilization, or in some cases, if the sperm has been directly harvested from the testicles. There are cases, especially, you know, here in Ireland is a high incidence of cystic fibrosis, uh, which has consequences about uh, the, uh, the quality of the, the sample. So, there are patients that actually need a surgical retrieval of the sperm straight from the straight from the testicle. So in this on, in those cases, ICSI is the only option for insemination. So after we inseminate the eggs and we leave them overnight, the second day, which we refer as the day one, we are checking for the fertilization. What we want to see is the presence of two little disc shapes. You can see um, um, here there are actually two, one on, uh, you know, one, one overlapping the other. Uh, these are what we call the pronuclei. These two pronuclei show us that the uh, egg is normally fertilized. One pronuclei basically contains the DNA from the egg, and the other one contains the DNA from the sperm. It's quite hard to differentiate which one is which, um, or, you know, on a, on, on a static image. So anything that has more or less than the, um, the number of two pronuclei, we will not uh, they will, we will not use it for uh, for further culture. Uh, three pronuclei or one pronuclei, as you can see here in this abnormal fertilization images, uh, have an incidence of, of about five percent each in you know from 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 the total fertilization and. Um, the, the three PNs, for example, the, the, the top right image is related more than 99% with embryo with embryo aneuploidy. So this is basically means that th they are genetically improper to, to develop a, a healthy pregnancy. Once we completed the fertilization check, the patient receives a phone call from the lab team to let them know how many eggs they have fertilized and we will continue the journey in the laboratory. The piece of equipment we use for uh, growing embryos and how we've managed to get all these images is called an embryoscope. Uh, so the embryoscope is basically an incubator which has a camera inside which takes minutes of uh, which takes images of uh, of the embryos every 10 minutes. And this way we can actually see not uh, not how only how they look but how they are progressing through uh, through their development. So this is standard uh, embryology assessment. Uh, we were expecting the vast majority of embryos to be to have to develop from one cell to two cells, then to cleave into four, then continue until they start the process of compaction around day four, when we can't really see how many cells they are, and then it's the start of blastulation, which is basically the first differentiation of the cells. Uh, and then on, on day five, day six, we're starting to see the full blastocyst. So um, when a patient is planning a PGT cycle, we would always do the procedure called, uh, um, you know, assisted hatching. 
So this means we have to break uh, the, the eggshell that's uh, uh, called zona pellucida just to allow some of the cells to herniate. And those are the cells that we are going to, uh, that we're going to send for genetic testing. Okay, so all the patients that have a PGT cycle will have their embryos grown until the blastocyst stage. So first of all, the embryos have to reach that stage. Unfortunately, not all of the normally fertilized egg, eggs uh, uh, reach that stage. It's very much depending on, on the age. So the, all, overall, about 40% of the embryos normally reach the blastocyst stage. So this stage is reach day five or day six. It's absolutely normal to have embryos that will require an extra day to, to reach that stage. The first thing we are looking is um, um, we're grading the embryo in terms of expansion, which is basically how big, how, 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 how big they grow. Um, and during the embryo development, this sh the, the, the shell that's surrounding the embryos, you can see in the top, uh, top left image is quite thick. And then while the embryo is growing, that, that, that shell is star starting to get um, <coughs> thinner. Uh, and this is because the blastocyst is growing and uh, it's, it's trying to expand and hatch out, basically. So in, for, for implantation in the womb, the blastocyst needs to be fully hatched out. So expansion of the embryos is uh, we graded uh, uh, with with a number whenever you're getting a, a report on the quality of the embryos. So it's we graded with numbers from one to six, one being only just starting to form a blastocyst, and six being completely hatched, so going out of the out of the shell. Now there is two distinct population of the cells. Uh, um, in, in in a blastocyst. So the next thing we look at um, when we grade the embryo is for the population of the cells called the inner cell mass. So this is the nice clump of cells here inside the embryo, which is basically the part of the embryo that is going to be that's going to form the, the baby. So the inner cell mass is um, uh, graded with we have three letters to grade it A, B, or C. A being the top grade, B being the good quality, and C means is the poor quality uh, of the inner cell mass. And the last thing that we're looking at is the population of the cells called the trophectoderm. So this is the outer cells that are just beneath the, uh, the shell. That part of the embryo is responsible to form the placenta. Um, and all the extra membranes that are involved in creating the pregnancy. The, these uh, embryos are all, uh, the, the, the trophectoderm is also graded with ABC letters, with A being the top. So when we discuss an embryo quality with you, when we phone, uh, you know, for, for the embryo updates, we will tell you that grade of the embryo is, was a free AA, which means it's a full, it, it's a full blastocyst, uh, you know, top quality in terms of uh, inner cell mass and trophectoderm or 5VB, which means is a hatching blastocyst, so it just started to herniate and, you know, it's a good quality embryo. This, grades, this, this grading system help us to choose between embryos just by looking, you know, at them in, in the microscope or, or with the help of this, uh, with this uh, embryoscope that I was telling you about. But unfortunately, this is not telling the full story. Uh, there is actually quite little information or correlation between the embryo morphology and the genetics of the of the embryo. This is actually a project that we're, we're, we started to work on um, two years ago, and it's an ongoing project, but there are other projects that uh, they, tr they try to find uh, correlations between uh, morphology and genetics. And uh, the, so far, it's not wouldn't be, uh, you know, the main the main method of selection using morphology or even morphokinetics. So this is a video of three embryos developing from the fertilization until day five. I'm just gonna click a start on it and all right, let's go. Okay. So you can see the, the um, this is what we see on a regular basis. We can see the exact time of uh, uh, cell cleavages 
and if they if they divide evenly or um, you know if one of the images have excluded uh, some of the cells <clears throat> the time points are important because we know that for example an embryo which divides into two cells before 24 hours has a much better chance of you know performing or, or forming a, a, a pregnancy than an embryo which takes more than 30 hours to divide uh, this helps us again to to make uh, to make the decision on selecting the best embryo um, this embryoscope is also an excellent excellent training tool for for our trainee embryologists to actually see how embryos are developing and you know be uh, become aware of all the aspects that are uh, happening throughout the uh, early culture of the embryos we put our trainees uh, embryologists they spend hundreds of hours of, uh, you know, uh, embryo assessment, watching videos like this, and it takes over two years to produce, you know, like to, to, to get them signed off on embryo selection. So, you know, like the vast majority of the, um, the decision are done, are still done by, by, by senior embryologists in all our labs. So now, that we've uh, discussed a bit of the embryology, we can talk about the, the genetics and why it is important. So each cell in our body uh, um, contains the chromosomes, the DNA. The nucleus basically of each cell is a, a small round structure within uh, each cell that acts like the brain of the cell. It tells each cell uh, of the body what to do, and the reason it knows it all is due to the presence of the chromosomes inside it. Within each cell, in our bodies, we have a set of 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, half of them inherit from the mother, half of them inherit from the father, so that makes a total of 46 chromosomes in each cell of our body. Uh, the chromosomes are made of, of coils of DNA uh, and is the DNA that is responsible for building, maintaining uh, our whole body structure. And even though the same DNA is present in any cells, in, in every cells of our body, each cell have a different, um, a different epigenetics. So basically they allow only parts of the, or, or only parts of the chromosomes to be expressed. This is why we have, you know, even though we have the same DNA in every cells, we have the, the cells are quite different, you know, like a nerve cell is totally different than a sperm cell or uh, a heart or a liver cell, but uh, they have the same, the same code, the same DNA. Um, so those genes that are stuck in the chromosomes are little segments of the DNA, which give the physical characteristics, which makes every one of us unique. Each gene is like one of uh, one specific set of instructions for one recipe within um, within a whole cookbook of the nucleus. The information the genes carry makes um, makes you who you are and determines what what you like basically. Um, straight off or curly hair, long legs, short uh, legs, the color of the eye, color of the skin, everything is, you know, like it's, uh, it comes, is generated by the instructions of the DNA. But unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the genes and the chromosomes are also responsible for passing uh, lots of nice characteristics, such as, uh, you know, um, hereditary diseases, I've mentioned cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, some forms of uh, familiar hereditary cancers or hunting dog disease, for example. So even though our body has a complete instruction manual of 46 chromosomes, uh, if one of these chromosomes is missing, or if there is an extra one, then the body function differently, uh, functions differently, uh, or may even have not be compatible, com compatible with life. So we have here um, uh, what is a normal male, male karyotype or a chromosome picture. There are two sets of uh, two two um, two sets of uh, each chromosomes. Uh, we know this is a male because the last pair of chromosomes we see one quite big here, the uh, the one before last in the uh, bottom left, 
and this is the X chromosome and the way smaller one, which is the Y chromosome. In a female karyotype, we have two X chromosomes. So this is why we need to, uh, you know, we need to do a genetic screening of the embryos. In fairness, the embryos have um, quite a different <coughs> genetic than the whole body um, because uh, half of the DNA is inherited from, from, from each parent and basically the embryo is, uh, you know, like the combination of two cells that have only half of the DNA. So um, we have different type of brain, uh, PGT testing, so PGTA stands for uh, testing for aneuploidies, uh, M stands for monogenic diseases, and SR for structural rearrangements. Um, PGT is done in a genetic test, uh, is a genetic test performed during uh, your IVF cycle with the goal of uh, being to improve your chances of getting pregnant and having a healthy baby. Uh, PGTA, so testing for aneuploidies, for a, a, it's basically looking at the number of chromosomes in each embryos. Um, there are, uh, um, the, the embryos have, um, they can have abnormal number of chromosomes, but they still can develop and actually give pregnancy. But the vast majority of the aneuploidies, if you know the number of the chromosome is not 46, as it should be, uh, even though we get uh, uh, biochemical, so we, we, we get a, a positive pregnancy test, and then we might even go further to, you know, uh, have a good scan on six, eight weeks after the after the embryo transfer. The vast majority of the aneuploidies end up in early miscarriage. So embryos with the incorrect number of chromosomes typically do not result in a successful pregnancy. Uh, the ones that have different number of chromosomes, there are very few variants that actually are compatible with a, with a live birth, which is, uh, you know, chromosome, uh, extra chromosome 21, which is responsible for the Down syndrome. There are a couple of uh, Edwards uh, syndrome as well for chromosome 18. Um, so we're looking for the PGTA, we're looking that the embryo has the correct number of, uh, the correct number of chromosomes. So this is used, this, this would actually decrease the time of uh, the, the time period between uh, starting an IVF cycle and having a life, uh, a healthy life worth pregnancy. Um, and this is basically the main goal of every IVF clinic in the world to decrease this time as much as, uh, as, much as possible. PGTM, the monogenic disease testing, is used for people who have known increased risk of passing a genetic addition caused by a single gene def defect. As I mentioned, cystic fibrosis is one of them. Huntington disease is again another one, but there are many others that can be done by using this test. And the PGTSR, um, so structural rearrangements, tests for changes in the size of the arrangements of the chromosomes. People with chromosome rearrangements, so like the Robertson, Robertsonian translocations, are uh, at an increased risk of producing embryos with incorrect number of chromosomes. Or uh, if if these rearrangements are, some of them are actually compatible, but uh, they uh, com compatible with uh, with pregnancy. But uh, you might pass this, uh, you know, um, the offsprings might be carriers and uh, is one of the main causes of uh, low fertility in the, you know, in the population affected by this kind of um, um, abnormalities. So these chromosomal rearrangements are rare, but, uh, and they're usually seen on, on a normal karyotype. Uh, the, pay, the, the you know the persons born with them may be completely normal, but uh, may have some degree of disability depending on uh, where the break in the chromosome is located. And as I mentioned, they might have you know like a, a impaired fertility um, over the over the life. 
So the PGTA cycling seems becomes basically it's a partnership between the patient, our clinic and the genetic providers. Um, we have we are working with some of the top uh, genetic providers in the world. Uh, so I'm just going to go uh, on uh, what we actually do when we're uh, uh, taking the samples for uh, genetic testing. So we've discussed the part uh, um, on which we've discussed the embryology part. Now we will talk about on how to get the biopsy samples and what comes next. So we're analyzing the uh, analyzing the blastocyst. As I said, we're doing a small nick in the shell, and we are collecting some of the cells that were supposed to uh, that are uh, from the trophectoderm. So some of the cells that uh, are part of the future placenta. We don't we don't biopsy cells from the inner cell mass. And we collect four or five cells from a couple of hundreds that um, a blastocyst have. And then uh, we put those samples in a tube and we send them for a genetic testing. So I'm just gonna turn on the video to actually see <coughs> what a biopsy looks like. Um, so after we check on day five, the embryo, uh, we want to see um, a few cells of the from the trophector that are hatching. Um, it might seem it might seem that the uh, you know the, the the video looks quite harsh. What we are doing is carefully taking a small piece of the embryo um, and. Uh, by, by this flip-flop method, we're taking only those samples and that samples that come off of the pipette are the ones that are going to be stuck in the tube and sent for the genetic testing. Um, we're using a laser to actually cut the cells before we do this uh, uh, flick movement. And um, <coughs> sorry. So this flicking is a quick movement to dislodge the cells and is much less traumatic uh, to an embryo than pulling them away, uh, which dam damages the surrounding cells or completely lasering them. So we use the laser only in very small amounts and it's a, you know, like it's a medical, uh, uh, it's a medical laser. Um, usually they don't, they don't harm any cells. We're trying to get the cells from as far away as possible from the, from the inner cell mass. Um, once we got the biopsy piece separated from the embryo, the embryo is then taken to a separate dish uh, to be frozen. So we are freezing all the embryos that, uh, um, from which we're collecting uh, biopsy samples uh, because we need to keep them in storage until we get the, the genetic results back. So once the blastocysts have been biopsied, they are frozen straight away. Uh, we are using vitrification, which is uh, um, the most successful method to, to freeze embryos. It's been, um, you know, it's been used for more than 15, 20 years now. Um, basically, this method uh, is um, used to uh, prevent the formation of ice crystals. Uh, which would damage the embryo from, you know, the, the, the ice crystals would damage the embryo from inside out. So we dehydrate the embryos, then we remove some of the fluid before we freeze them. Um, and uh, to freeze them, we use a high security uh, straw. So they're all, all, the, um, all the embryos are uh, fr frozen one by one and they're sealed before we put them in the tank. Uh, to avoid any any sort of contamination, and they are stored in liquid nitrogen, which is basically keeping them at minus 196 Celsius degrees until they're ready to thaw. At this temperature, the, basically all biological activity is stopped, so they can be they can be kept for an indefinite amount of time. I think so far the world record is a uh, healthy um, life birth after an uh, embryo that was frozen 27 years before. 
obviously, I think it was not used for the, for the same patient. Probably it was uh, an embryo donation. This comes from US. So we store them in this liquid nitrogen tanks containing many embryos. Each each patient has, uh, um, you know, like each uh, each patient has their own location in the tanks, their own address. So uh, we keep uh, good traceability of the samples. We know at any point which samples are where located. So um, then before, uh, after we get the genetic results done, we have to tow the embryos, which is basically the reverse process of vitrification. Our embryo survival rates are usually about 98%. Actually, this year I think it's 100%. So it's a very, you know, like a very, sh um, very good method of um, uh, for, for for storing your uh, for for storing the embryos. Then the cells are sent uh, the, um, are sent to uh, to the provider of uh, genetic testing. Uh, as I said, we use the Repromedia and Cooper, uh, Cooper Genomics. Uh, both of these uh, uh, companies have more than 25, 27 years of experience with PGT testing. They are basically the ones that you know invented and developed this, this kind of testing. The piece of each embryo is processed there and tested for the number of the chromosome it contains to help us select the best possible embryo for the, for the patient. The data is analyzed by, the, by their scientists, and they give us a report on the genetics of each embryo. So <clears throat> after we get the report, so they, the images that they're having using their machines and um, lately artificial intelligence look like this. So everything that's a straight line, uh, it means that it's euploid. Basically, they have two, two, um, two copies of uh, each chromosome. And, oh, sorry. And the image below shows that this embryo has basically an euploidy on chromosome 10, has one extra chromosome 10, and one minus chromosome 17. So, this is what the uh, this is the images that they process, and then they send a full report on you know with with outcomes of the embryo. So when we get the outcomes, they're basically split it in these categories: euploid, meaning normally uh, the, genetically speaking. So they have these euploid embryos with the you know with the correct number of chromosomes have the highest uh, chance of uh, viable pregnancy. Then we have the aneuploid, which incorporates all the embryos that have one extra or one less chromosome. Um, so they have an incorrect number of chromosomes in uh, all the cells in the body. These aneuploid embryos typically do not result in a successful pregnancy, even though, as I said, they can they can produce initial, uh, you know, they can have a positive test and even uh, and even. Uh, even a, a clinical pregnancy assessed by you know fetal heartbeat, and uh, only few of this type of aneuploidies are actually compatible with life. As I said, Down syndrome and Edward syndromes are, or are are some of them. And the third possibility is to have uh, a mosaic embryo. So. This is where it gets a bit confusing. Mosaic embryos contain two or more different chromosomes patterns within the one embryo. So some of the cells have normal number of chromosomes, but some of the cells have abnormal number of chromosomes. So uh, it's a lot of research going on um, um, at this stage all over the world to try to distinguish which type of mosaicism is uh, you know, compatible, but in order to obtain those, uh, you know, those answers, uh, all, you know, we, we, we need a lot of this kind of embryos to be transferred. So normally what happens with mosaics, they usually have a lower implantation rate, but there are also a good number of mosaic embryos that turn out, you know, to, to, to form a viable pregnancy. So uh, they are considered second option 
um, you know, especially if if no uh, no um, normal embryos are, uh, are are available. Usually, what we do when we have mosaic embryos to transfer is either we get a, a, a consultation with our doctors or even with a qualified genetic counselor. Um, there are other abnormalities. Some of the embryos have more than one chromosome involved, uh, either uh, extra or uh, uh, minus. Uh, those are um, <clears throat> what we call complex aneuploidies. Uh, they are not used for uh, they are not used for any treatment. There is no information at this point that any of them uh, any employed embryos have actually generated a, a viable pregnancy. And uh, the last option, unfortunately, this happens as uh, as well. It's to obtain no result. So this occasionally happens. Usually, it's less than five percent of the of the samples that we're sending. Um, they um, some of the samples that they're just not able to 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 get the DNA and uh, get the readings from it. Um, this is you um, you know when when you get this kind of results, uh, uh, the doctor usually discuss this. We offer uh, either rebiopsy for uh, free of charge because. It might be that this is just a technical issue, either from our side, or either from the genetic testing, uh, or the patients are also able to opt for, uh, you know, transferring that embryo without uh, without uh, testing it again, like in a regular non-PGTA cycle. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion if a rebiopsy is indicated. As far as we can see from our figures. Um, you know, for a rebiopsy would basically mean that the embryo has to be thawed, rebiopsied, and frozen again. So basically, it will be, before it gets transferred, uh, it would be uh, frozen and thawed twice. Um, from the figures that we have here, um, especially here in Plonsky, there is no uh, there is no difference in outcomes if uh, for for the embryos that uh, had to be uh, rebiopsied or frozen and, and taught twice before the transfer. The main, uh, you know, to give you some ideas of the chances of having, having uh, uh, euploid embryo, uh, normally the genetic uh, embryo is the, 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 the biggest issue, uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest, how should I say it? <laughs> The age is the more the most determined uh, factor in um, embryo uh, euploidy. So in this graph we have the purple line um, is the normal embryos, and we can see that the amount of normal embryos decrease with the age. Um, if for women under 30, 37, like half of the embryos are normally uh, genetically, but after 37 the uh, euploidy rate starts to drop quite drastically uh, and uh, we end up for uh, you know uh, uh, for women above 42 years of age uh, where we have um, just about 15 percent of the embryos normally in a similar way the red line is the aneuploid which increases with age and this is this this is has to do with the basically with the aging of the uh, aging of the oocytes so once the female ages uh, there are uh, in, um, some processes at the, at the chromosomes that uh, prevent the splitting of the chromosomes normally between the egg and the and the um, polar body which we shown earlier so once the once we have the the, the genetic results, um, we we have a platform where we get all the all the results also via email, and these results are uploaded in the patient's file and they're ready for the patient or the couple to you know come and uh, discuss them with uh, one of our doctors. At the return consultation with one of our doctors, uh, the results of all the biopsies are discussed. Uh, the form at the top um, shows an example of the report which is sent uh, to us. 
it outlines the overall results for each embryos, which chromosomes, if any, are uh, implicated in, in, in the result, and the interpretation by, the, by, by their scientists. These recommendations will impact the decision made by our doctor as to which embryo will be suitable for um, uh, transfer and potentially in which order. So uh, we are actually started to be implicated in a, a worldwide project on, uh, as I mentioned earlier about the mosaicism, on uh, making a hierarchy of uh, different mosaic, uh, mosaicist types, which ones are the, you know, uh, which ones have the best outcomes, depending on which chromosome is involved and uh, um, the percentage of the mosaicism. So this picture will try to explain a little better that um, what I mean about mosaicism. So um, you know the uh, a nucleoid embryo has all the green cells. So the, these are these are basically the normal cells. Um, the mosaic embryo you can see they have some of the cells normal, some of the cells uh, with uh, genetic imbalances. And the, the one that has all the blue cells is the aneuploid, the one. So basically, all the cells are affected by that aneuploid. So <clears throat> when we're taking the biopsy, um, you know, we, 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 you can see the red circle. So that would represent the part of the embryo that we, we, we are biopsying. We can see that some of the cells are blue and some of the cells are green. And this is what basically causes a mosaic. You can see, you know, in the uh, in the above report that embryos number ten and eleven are high level or low level of mosaicism. Uh, high level means more than fifty percent. Low level means below fifty percent. Now, whether these embryos would be suitable for a transfer would need advice from our doctor and the genetic counselor. So, in the top left picture, we have uh, bottom left. Sorry, a picture we have. Uh, there are um, 23 pairs of chromosomes in a, uh, like it should normally be, but you can see that chromosome 16 has uh, a third one, so that would be called the trisomy 16. So if this embryo is, is created, the pregnancy would very likely end in the first trimester with the miscarriage. Trisomy 16 is a common cause of miscarriage, so this embryo would not be recommended by our doctors to be, to be transferred. And you know, selecting, basically making a selection, the genetic selection of the embryos. This is what we're trying to achieve to you know to uh, avoid um, to avoid the incidence of miscarriage and, as I mentioned before, to shorten the time between start of the treatment and life birth. So this is, as I said, the main goal of every IVF clinic. So we've come to the last part of the PGTA cycle, the transfer day. So once we have the normal embryo or even the mosaic embryo, and we've decided that we're going ahead with the transfer. Um, sorry, okay. So uh, the nursing staff will bring you in the procedure room. The doctor will prepare you for the embryo transfer. Um, the embryo transfers, uh, even though probably from, from, you know, from the patient perspective, it's a very uh, delicate procedure. From the embryology is one of the pretty straightforward procedures that we do. Uh, so it basically uh, relies on, it's guided by an ultrasound probe that it's gonna rest on your tummy. You can see here in the image, the full bladder. This is very much, very important to have a full bladder before the transfer. It helps very much on, uh, uh, you know, a visualization of the, of the womb. This is the big uh, um, black uh, spot here is the, the, the bladder. And when the doctor is ready, um, you know, when the doctor is ready, made all the preparations is ready for the, for the transfer the laboratory will hand in the catheter containing the embryo. And you, as you can see, the catheter coming into the uterus here is depositing a little uh, spot there. So that's what we call the flash. Uh, when you hear that the flash is, uh, uh, you know, they seen the flash that basically means that the, a small amount of media with the embryo was placed in the, you know, in the right place. 
So once the transfer is completed, the doctor will hand back the catheter to the, the embryology, and we will always check under the microscope just to make sure that uh, you know that that small amount of media was actually you know containing the embryo, so the embryo is not still in the catheter. It happens very rarely, but it, it, it's still you know like we we like to everything we do in the IVF lab, we'd like to double check and triple check. Um, and after the transfer is, you know, is completed, no sedation or needles are required for the embryo transfer. So this is why it's quite a straightforward. And uh, yeah, we would like everybody to be, you know, like to have a good feeling about this. And then is the two weeks time until we do the test, which is, uh, you know, excruciating, uh, thoughts uh, until we get uh, we get to see the you know the first test result so going back to the pgta um, the question is should we do it for everyone well you've seen that uh, you know it's an invasive procedure we are not improving uh, um, um, you know the embryo by taking the the, the cells from it and there is a small chance that the embryo will not survive the biopsy um and also freezing and towing about two less than two percent don't don't survive freezing and towing so it's usually recommended where the potential benefit of the testing outweighs the risk of the embryo so but it may be recommended for patients who have had a series of miscarriages with no explanation um, i would recommend it probably for all the ladies uh, over 35 years of age Anyone experience unexplained infertility, which is no pregnancy and no, no cause, and patients who had previous IVF attempts with no pregnancy or with, uh, you know, um, several early miscarriages. And some people will even opt for PGT just for the peace of mind, the, you know, to help them reduce the time to, uh, to obtain the pregnancy or to reduce the number of embryos transferred. Um, uh, number of embryo transfers that they have to go through and you know they just want to ensure that they have a healthy pregnancy and probably one of the you know like one of the main uh, reasons why somebody would choose pgta is as i said to avoid uh, avoid the trauma of going through you know an early miscarriage so this is one of the things that um, PGTA improves, as we can see here in, 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 in this, you know, it improves, basically it improves the pregnancy, the healthy, the life birth pregnancy on all age groups um, and compared to the cycles that uh, don't have. So we basically, um, we basically do less transfers because we are eliminating the embryos that have that they're definitely not going to produce a healthy pregnancy. This data is, uh, you know, this graph is taken from the UK data, and this is done studying over almost 200,000 cycles. So you can see the light blue bars are the live birth rates for PGTA tested embryos, which is significantly higher in all age groups when compared to the purple bars, which are the non-PGT tested embryos. Uh, you can see that the PGT reduces the effect of maternal age, showing uh, here that a 42-year-old lady will, with a normal PGTA embryo will have the same chances of having life birth as a 33-year-old with a non-tested embryo. So um, yeah, this is the, the, these are basically the you know the the big advantages of uh, testing the embryos before uh, before a transfer. So thank you everyone for uh, um, listening to to this presentation. I hope uh, you've enjoyed this webinar and I hope uh, it answered some of the questions that you may have about uh, PGTA and genetic testing. I'll hand back to Ifa and if you have any questions, please be free to get in touch with us.